So we're going to start off with Josh from Elephant Energy. Um, Josh is actually a founder of Elephant Energy, which is a, a Boulder-based company, and they're trying to make home electrification as easy as possible. Um, Josh tells me he eats and sleeps and breathes, electrify everything. <laughs> and I kind of believe it because of the time you sent me your presentation last night. <laughs> I promised I'd have it by the end of the day. <laughs> okay. It was before midnight. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, <clears throat> oh, so uh, I don't know if I actually need the microphone because I get pretty excited talking about heat pumps. But <laughs> if anybody can hear me, I'll come back over and maybe walk around with it for a minute. Uh, yeah, so just a little bit. You know who I am? I'm one of the founders of Elephant Energy. Had mystery woman slash man for today. I didn't know who was going to join me. Sean in the back has uh, decided to, to, to join us for today. Uh, so a little bit about me. As, as Mike said, I eat, sleep, and breathe. Electrify everything. I have the I have the shirt that I wear pretty much every day. It's a little beat up at this point. I have a few of them. Wife makes me clean my laundry every now and then. But I really do care about electrify everything. I've spent the last 15 years in energy and sustainability. Uh, I've started and built companies across solar energy, EVs, EV charging, uh, heat pumps, and more. These are all projects that I've actually done. Um, in the bottom, I deployed autonomous electric vehicles, deployed EV charging stations. Uh, I once ran one of the largest, actually was the largest EV fleet in the country in 2014. I once had a thousand drivers in LA sharing EVs in Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and Postmates, all the delivery companies. And I built solar projects. This is in Alamosa, Colorado, uh, a couple hours south of here. This project was from 2012-ish, so it's been, a, it's been a while. It was one of the biggest solar projects in the country. And then, of course, I'm a pretty big heat pump enthusiast, as you can tell. Uh, the pictures of me in the elephant suit are in my own crawl space, so I typically don't go into customers' homes and dress like that and do you know, inappropriate to hugs and kisses of the technology. But I really do care about this space. And so as I said, founder of Elephant Energy, we exist to make home electrification as easy as possible. We want to make it fun for people. Uh, we believe that climate change is an urgent effing problem. And we think the technologies exist to uh, help everyone electrify. And just, I think we as an industry are just not moving fast enough. Heat pumps work, heat pump water heaters work, induction stoves, EVs, solar. They all work, yet we're not deploying them fast enough at scale. Um, our model is one where we work directly with homeowners to understand their goals, their pain points, and their motivations, and help them craft what their journey is going to be for home electrification. Uh, so we'll work with them on the system design. We have a network of vetted contractors that we work with across all the trades, so HVAC, plumbing, electrical, energy efficiency, uh, the list goes on. Uh, we also do, we handle rebates and incentives for everyone, financing, and again, just trying to make it as easy as possible to help people electrify over time. So, the presentation is all about electrification and why it matters, uh, what is electrification, and talking about your own electrification roadmap. So, I know this crowd knows this, but what is electrification um, and why is it important? First, in order to get to net zero as, as a country by 2050, I think there's four things that we have to do. We have to deploy a shit ton of, sorry, a lot of wind and solar. Whether that's rooftop, utility scale, community solar, doesn't really matter. We have to deploy lots of it. Technology is there. Uh, two, wind doesn't always blow, sun doesn't always shine. We hear that a lot, but it's a, re it's a reality. We have to manage the volatility of renewables, uh, third, we have to transition to all new vehicle sales across uh, fleets and personal vehicles. They all have to be EVs, and there's an amazing number of models coming out. It's no longer just like a Tesla and Nissan Leaf and Chevy Bolt uh, lineup. There's all types of things. 
And then fourth, we have to transition um, all new appliances in buildings, how you heat your building, how you cool it, how you cook in your home, it all has to be transitioned uh, to electric. And that also means your lawn mowers, your chainsaws, uh, leaf blowers, like there are, the electric versions are awesome. Um, you're gonna see just millions and millions of these deployed in years to come. But we exist to make it move faster because it's not moving fast enough. And last thing I'd say is if we, um, if we don't do these things over the next couple of years, uh, I think that a lot of the, the sexier technologies like green hydrogen and carbon <laughs> capture and sequestration, a lot of really cool things coming, they're really not gonna matter because they're not gonna get here uh, soon enough. It'll be too late. So we have the technologies now, we gotta deploy. Uh, my presentation, so the first three things I think are being worked on. We've gotten a lot better in this country over the last few years, but I think we're still not there on transitioning buildings. So that will be the focus of the rest of the presentation. Um, as you all know, um, a lot of emissions happen as a result of residential buildings and vehicles, and a lot of those decisions on how we heat power our homes, the vehicles we drive, what fuel we cook with, all those decisions are made at the kitchen table. Uh, so we wanna be there to help, uh, help educate customers to make uh, decisions on these technologies. So again, we have all the tools to electrify everything today. Uh, there's pretty much, pretty much everything, if you look it up, there's an there's a electric equivalent, whether it's a motorcycle, a leaf blower, a chainsaw, lawnmower, they're all there. Um, so, second part of the presentation here, I want to talk about the basics of home electrification. Uh, really, there are four things in and around the home that consume the vast majority of your natural gas, your fossil fuels, if you haven't fully electrified. It's your furnace, water heater, gas range, and your gas-powered vehicle in most cases. And luckily, there's technologies that exist um, for each one of these. And the one that I uh, want to focus on in a minute will be the replacing of your furnace. For a lot of people, it's 80% of their uh, natural gas usage in their home, and there's heat pumps. Heat pumps, heat pumps, heat pumps. Uh, they work, they work in Colorado, they work everywhere, they're amazing. We're still getting better, but pretty incredible, magical piece of technology. So, why electrify? There's obviously a ton of benefits for home electrification, starting with it's a cleaner planet. If you burn gas in your home now as a furnace or a water heater, you basically have a tailpipe in your basement or mechanical room. Ideally, it bends to the outside, but probably not perfectly. Uh, two, electrification improves home comfort. Uh, it just provides a better experience. We oftentimes pair weatherization, uh, air sealing, and insulation with our projects to just improve comfort. And if anyone here has a, has a heat pump, you'll know that it just provides more uh, consistent cooling across or heating across the home. Uh, third, can save money. You have to design the system right, uh, but you can have dependable electricity costs going forward instead of the volatility of gas. And then if you have solar, you pair, you know, if solar and heat pumps and these technologies, they pair together, kind of peanut butter and jelly, they're better together than they are individually, and it really makes the economics great, um, combined with the various incentives that, that are out there as well. Uh, third, electrification can add home value. Um, there's a lot of studies out there that say upgrading and modernizing your home are worthwhile investments with the right return on investment. Uh, last, increased safety. We, heard, we hear all the time of carbon monoxide poisoning um, and other you know, asthma in the home because of gas cooking. There's just a lot of studies that continue to come out that paint a pretty bad picture around burning fossil fuels in your home, which when you think about it is probably not too much of a surprise that there's negative impacts on health. Um, so I mentioned the four, the four horsemen of, uh, horse people, sorry, of home electrification. Uh, I'm gonna talk mostly about heat pumps. So, I'm sure everybody, everybody knows what heat pumps are. They come in a couple different flavors, ones that look like your traditional air conditioner and ones with dual fans uh, from a company from Mitsubishi, cold climate units. And heat pump is obviously a misnomer, right? They don't just heat your home like your furnace does. They also cool like your air conditioner. They provide humidity control. Uh, and they improve your air quality, whether it's because you're not burning gas in the home anymore, 
you're cycling in through your filter more frequently, um, you now have better humidity control, like I mentioned. So just a lot of ways that they're better. And they're super efficient. Uh, they're, without getting into any arguments on, on physics and thermodynamics, uh, they have effectively greater than 100% efficiency because they're not just burning fuel to generate uh, energy and warmth, they're actually putting <laughs> it from outside to inside. And it's likely that everybody here already has one or two heat pumps in their home. Your refrigerator, effectively a heat pump. Uh, your air conditioner is a heat pump. The heat pumps that we install just have a reversing valve on them and snap. So now instead of just cooling, they can also heat your home. Um, I guess this does a better job than my my explanation on heat pumps, but I just system runs one direction in the summer to produce cooling, and it runs in the opposite direction to produce heating. That's kind of the simple view of it all. And it kind of sounds wild that when it's negative 15 degrees out, you can still pull warm air and have 80, 90 degree air, but um, you, you can, it's kind of magical. And uh, there's a lot of, still a lot of heat in negative 20 degree air on a, on a Kelvin, Kelvin scale, maybe not so much on the Fahrenheit scale. Um, so there's two types of heat pumps uh, that we deploy. We deploy ducted ones and ductless. Uh, if you already have a furnace today and you have a forced air system, you probably would look at a ducted system as the easiest way to replace, assuming your ducts are in good shape. And then there is a ductless system as well, where it's individual rooms have their own, uh, they're called heads, and you see a picture of one at the top and one at the bottom, ceiling set, also wall-mounted units. What it does, it just allows you to control uh, heating and cooling on an individual room basis. So awesome control, high efficiency units, you know, whisper quiet, and all the benefits of, of electrification. Uh, won't bore you too much on ducted versus ductless, <coughs> but uh, again, if you have a ducted system, you probably look at a ducted one. If you have boiler or radiant heating, there, really, there aren't great solutions from an electric, electrification perspective yet. I think there will be in a couple years, with the exception of replacing those systems with, with mini split systems. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the myths that are out there. Uh, myth number one, isn't it more expensive to heat and cool my home with electricity rather than gas? Um, I think a couple years ago, that was, you know, the, the economics weren't so much in the favor like they are today, but the, the economics have shifted over time. Gas continues to, to climb. Uh, natural gas prices go up, have gone up considerably. I think my Excel bill has gone up something like 3x in the last two years. It's kind of it's kind of wild, just on a per uh, per gas therm basis. So, well, and electricity has climbed a little bit, but not to that extent. So. The savings are there, and we like to model it out for, for customers and show what is possible when you get off the gas. Second, we'll, we'll talk about this one. The myth is that I heard heat pumps don't work in cold climates. Uh, we have going on 100 heat pumps here in Colorado. Roughly half of them have backup heating of some kind, almost all electric resistance backup, and half of them don't. Um, and we design systems both ways. We design systems so that your home will be heated and cooled despite the, the most extreme uh, conditions that we face. We'll show some data on that. And then last, heat pump technology is too new for me to risk adopting it. Um, for all the folks here who have been to, to Europe and Asia, you see heat pumps absolutely everywhere. Technology, millions and millions of units sold every year by some of the biggest uh, companies in the world. And so it's not a new technology. Like I said, you, are, you likely already have one or two heat pumps in your home. Okay, so you heard me say, yes, they work in the cold, but come on, come on, Josh, tell me the truth here. <laughs> and uh, again, it's this is this is actual data from the, we'll call it the Arctic Blast of 2022. So in December, three months or so ago, uh, we had temperatures negative 14 to negative 20. And of course, I'm up, I'm up all night checking. We, have, we monitor all of our systems, so I'm looking at everybody's system performing properly. Uh, didn't sleep that much that night because I was, you know, wanting to make sure that everybody's having a great experience. But the, the data was in, and we were able to keep people's homes as as advertised for them, keeping them at kind of their desired temperature. Again, despite the fact that it was was so cold. 
There's just a couple quotes here. As a founder, I love seeing these quotes from our customers. They proactively were messaging us on Twitter or sending you know, emails saying, I, even I was surprised. Like I was a believer and then here it is, data is in, my house was warm and I don't have any backup heating and it was sub-zero. And that's just, that's awesome to see. Um, that said, there's, heat pumps are still a challenging technology to get right on the installation side. And these are a couple of things you really need to consider um, with whoever whoever you work with if you decide to electrify. First is that not all heat pumps are created equal, right? Uh, some of them are single stage, two stage. We use variable speed. Some are cold climate. Some aren't cold climate. And you can have a dramatically different experience um, based on the technology. So we work with a couple of the best OEMs to select the right one for you. Two, getting the system size is is really important. So we bring data to this, we collect electricity and energy and gas bills to understand how your home actually performs. We often do what's called blower door tests to depressurize your home and see how leaky it is, whether there needs to be like air sealing and insulation work. But the point is, we're a bunch of data science nerds. We like to bring data to the problem and it's solvable um, through, through data. Uh, third, energy efficiency. So you can't solve problems in a home that um, you know related to heating and cooling. If your if your home is just a sieve, right? It really doesn't matter how big or small or special your heating and cooling system is. So we work with customers again to do some of that air sealing work, weatherization. Uh, it goes a long way, and will reduce your your energy bills. And then comfort. We we try not to. We're not in the business of selling heat pumps. We're in the business of trying to solve home comfort challenges for people. So. Most people here probably have a room that is five degrees too hot in the summer, five degrees or more too cold in the winter, and we can do things to solve those, and those are the things that, that people care about and actually want. Uh, not, I realize that not everybody gets quite as excited about heat pumps as, as I do, and, that, and that's okay. I don't, I don't expect that uh, or want that. Uh, that would be a little dystopian for me. Uh, last is the electrical consideration. So if you decide to electrify a bunch of things, uh, it's going to take a lot of amperage and, and power. And I, I constantly hear, well, I'm gonna have to work with Excel or United to upgrade my utility, uh, my electrical service, or my panel size is too small, or there's not enough breaker positions. We can do a bunch of creative things such that we can get people fully electrified and passing permits and code and all of that on 100 amp service, on 200 amp service, we very, very rarely have to actually upgrade, but it's an important thing to think about. And if you think you're going to electrify a bunch of things over time and add EV charging and solar and storage uh, down the road, it's important to just have that conversation at the beginning and get the get the design right. So, uh, almost done here, but how how should you go about doing home electrification? Or my view of it, I think first is if I were in anyone's shoes, I just get a clear idea of what you're looking for. What are your motivations, your goals, your pain points? You're looking to get off of gas. You're looking to improve improve home comfort. Uh, are you looking to improve air quality? What is your goal? And that will determine kind of how you prioritize things and um, just how you go about doing these type of projects. Two, I look at where you are today. I don't think most people are looking to just you know snap their fingers spend a bunch of money and fully go to a net zero home. I think that's unrealistic for not even the early adopters, but certainly the mass market. Uh, people are gonna replace technologies when they fail, right? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people replace their water heater when it actually fails, and that's unfortunate because it's really hard to replace uh, on an emergency basis with something like heat pump water heater. Um, people don't do that with their cars. They don't wait until they break down, they, they hear them you know, starting to fail and they call somebody to take it to the shop, whatever, but um, just the whole point is that your, your appliances will fail over time. Uh, just next time you're replacing your vehicle, next time you're thinking you're replacing your furnace, your stove, uh, consider electric and dig into what it's going to take. I don't expect everyone to do it all at once. I, I personally didn't do it all at once either. Um, third, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, Great resources on my own website, but then there's organizations in, in the city of Longmont, in Boulder County. There's an com organization called Rewiring America. They just have an amazing set of tools to help educate people and provide information on and um, 
estimates on savings and cost and incentives. They're just, yeah, they're a really good organization. So suggest, you know, part of your, you decide to electrify, part of your journey should, should start there. Uh, fourth, think about the financial side of all of this. It can cost a chunk of money up front. Obviously your operating costs are going to be lower over time, but think about that and educate yourself on all the incentives that exist, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act on the federal side, the state side, Excel, United Powers, County of Boulder, uh, Longmont, if you're from Denver by chance, probably not. But there's there's an amazing set of, tech, uh, of rebates and incentives out there. You have to pick the right technologies for them. You have to have the right installer partners to unlock them. You have to actually fill out the paperwork for them. But there really are a lot of uh, things out there. And then last thing I'd say is, all this may sound daunting, and it can be. If you try to do it all at once, uh, but that's not the point. I think it's just get started. Start doing research. If you want to replace your stove, you can buy a seventy-five dollar like plug-in induction stove on Amazon that is single burner, but it actually works really well. And just start feeling the benefits of all this stuff. Rent an EV next time you rent a car somewhere. Just try it all out. And I think there's no yeah there's no perfect path for anyone. Just just get started. Uh, we, we ourselves have developed a tool for, it's called Your Electrification Roadmap. You can go to our website and see to get started, fill it out, ask a bunch of questions on what you're looking to do and, and how old your appliances are, and it tries to lay out a roadmap. Here's what it could look like over time. Uh, and here's how you think you can get your, your journey started. So uh, I know we're saving the Q&A for the end, so I think that's, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you all. Thanks, Josh. Yep. All right. So next up, we've got the city of Loma, and that's headed up by Susan Bartlett, who's the director of Energy Strategies and Solutions. I just think of Susan as being in charge of anything you ever <coughs> to do with home electrification. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then uh, you're gonna, you got a couple other folks with you. We've got. Mike, who's going to be talking about the metering program, and Ryan, who's going to be talking about efficiency works and the rebate program, which is just getting rolled out and pretty exciting. So, I'm going to switch over to. And, and I'll just say we're going to kind of tag team to make sure we can stay within our time and get to the QA. So, I'll kind of do the high five to Ryan, he'll pass off to Mike. Okay, I need to go. Ah, yep. And you just have to go a little down there. This mic is also on it. Well, I, I don't know if I project as well as Josh, so if I wander and you can't hear me, just push me back over here. Um, here we are. So, this is a shameless plug for our sustainability group. They just recently wrapped up the Sustainability and Climate Action Report. It's available on the website if you're interested in learning more, but I thought this group might be interested in some of the highlights, like the fact that uh, our last greenhouse gas inventory showed a reduction of 13% over the 2016 baselines. We're making progress. Also, um, Longmont received an A in its CDP reporting, and that's kind of um, transparent environmental reporting. Only two cities in Colorado have ever received an A, so Longmont for the first time this year, we have last year, and the city of Boulder. And I think all together, worldwide, there may be only 130 cities that, that receive an A. So, so well done. in more of the details on the annual reporting of uh, Lisa Knobloch and our sustainability team presented to City Council on March 7th. And you can go ahead and watch that and get a lot more, a lot more details. So I encourage you to do that. Um, it's, it's kind of a bumpy transition here, but beneficial building electrification kind of falls under that climate action road mapping. And uh, I got to come and talk with your group last August about the planning that we were doing as a city and as a community. You guys were 
really gracious to, we weren't quite done yet, and you heard what we were up to. We were able to take the plan to city council in October of last year. <coughs> they gave us the green light to get going, and uh, we started right out of the gate. We have 13 strategies that are in the plan, and the nine strategies in blue here are the ones that are kind of our top priority, but the ones that we're started on now and, uh, and we want to make good progress there. The four yellow on the bottom, we haven't forgotten about, we're not going to ignore. They just have a little longer runway. And uh, we're staying plugged in with regional groups in case opportunities arise. Uh, but, but the nine blue are our top priority. And I don't want to go through the details of every single strategy, but I did want to share a little bit about the things that I'm the most excited about that we're doing. One is that we're taking a really good, uh, close look at our distribution grid. Um, part of that is related to the new data that we're gonna have as a result of the advanced metering infrastructure that's going in. We're gonna have data we've never had before. It's gonna help us understand our distribution a little bit better. It's also gonna help us understand how our customers are using electricity and give us some tools that we need to, uh, to take on the increased load that's gonna come from building electrification as well as electric vehicles. So we're really excited about that. Also, there's this concerted outreach and education portion that goes with any plan. And you guys are a great opportunity for us to be doing just that. So thank you again for inviting us back. Um, and as Josh said, there's there's a lot of information about how to electric light buildings. And so what we're hoping to do with partners like Efficiency Works and hopefully, you know, the contractor, uh, the contractor pool as well is kind of gather all the information that's out there and distill it into kind of bite-sized pieces so you can start thinking about how you're going to take that journey and what the best steps are for you. And and part of that education may just be what is it and how would it apply to me and to my space. And then how do I pay for it? How do I get it done? So we're hoping to provide that information in, in some reasonable bite-sized pieces. The next thing is program collaboration. Um, Ryan's gonna talk about what's happening at Efficiency Works. So Efficiency Works is um, it's our rebate administrator that is run through Cut River Power Authority. And um, they're doing some really exciting, great things that he's gonna talk about that are gonna go live. We also uh, work a lot with Boulder County, and we want to be able to combine all the resources that are available for uh, Longmont residents and business owners in a way that makes electrification as affordable and practical as possible. We're going to keep doing that. We're also going to work with the state when the state has its programs ready. They're not ready yet, but they're coming, and, and we want to be able to pull those programs in. Another important component of building electrification is how we look at new construction over time. And uh, the city of Longmont is part of a regional co cohort that is looking at how to get to net zero buildings by uh, 2030 <coughs> in, in new construction. And we're going to bring some of those recommendations back to the city. We won't have them until later in the spring. We'll bring it back to the city. They'll work through our normal code adoption process. City Council will have a chance to take a look at that later this year. And then I wanted to finish with a technical demonstration project that I'm really excited about. It's called Extreme Heat. It's being managed by our sustainability team, but it's a collaboration. So it's um, sustainability, it's Longmont Power and Communications, it's Housing and Community Investment, it's Longmont Housing Authority, it's Efficiency Works, it's potentially Energy Outreach Colorado. We're kind of bringing all these resources together and the objective of the demonstration is to take kind of a whole home approach to uh, to both um, to, to things like health and safety, access, uh, weatherization, and also electrification. And we want to look at doing this in three building types. So we're going to look at small multifamily, we're going to look at mobile homes, and also single family homes that come in through our housing rehabilitation program and the idea is we want to be able to gather data on what it takes to do this kind of whole home approach how much does it cost what are the technologies that work best in different types of 
buildings, um, is the contractor pool available to help us do this work? And, and how do we make sure that we can scale it? So part of the demonstration is identifying additional funds. Uh, right now we're going to use some Boulder County sustainability tax dollars, we're using LPC efficiency dollars, and we want to be able to, uh, to build more in so that we can scale this program over time. So I'm very excited about that and what we're going to learn this year. Um, but I want to pass back to Ryan so he can share a little bit more about the program collaboration and what's happening in the efficiency groups. Hello, everybody. Let's see that. Down arrow? Got it. All right. Um, thank you, Susan. I'll start with, I just want to gauge the crowd a little bit. Show of hands, who's heard of Efficiency Works before? Pretty good. Okay, give me a heart deep. I need to go into this. <laughs> so, what I want to talk about uh, this evening is just a little bit about what programs Efficiency Works is currently offering, and then going into what changes we're making in, in our programs this year and how those are going to uh, affect all of our customers. And I thought I'd just start by defining who is an eligible customer for Efficiency Works. So, specifically for uh, Longmont, one needs to purchase their electricity from Longmont Power and Communications, and then one needs to reside in a single family home, a town home, or a um, apartment or condo. An apartment or condo needs to be, uh, only have four units or less within the whole building. Anything more than that will go into our commercial programs. As well as use one of Efficiency Works uh, uh, registered service providers, right? So one needs to use like Energy Elephant, one of Efficiency Works service providers. They go through training with Efficiency Works to ensure that they are meeting our standards for installation, uh, commissioning, and health and safety standards. All right, so Flat River is exploring multiple DERs or distributed energy resources, uh, and we look at those to look to ways to use less electricity or to shift when we are demanding most electricity. And our residential programs with our own communities, we have decided to focus on energy efficiency and building electrification in order to meet our goals in our programs. And we have three programs that we offer in our Efficiency Works residential world. So the first one is our advising and assessments program. The advising assessment program is a heavily discounted in-home assessment, $60 to the customer. Um, and that gets a, an advisor in their home to engage with the customer to understand their experience in the home, what their goals are, what they're trying to achieve, uh, and then to do some you know, inspection of the home, looking at the thermal envelope, doing diagnostic testing of the, of the HVAC system, and then helping that homeowner come up with a plan of what they should do, what order they should do things in, and what sort of resources are available to, to start those projects. Uh, we also have a free advising service. So that's for a customer who's not, maybe not quite ready, just has a lot of questions, doesn't want someone doing tests in the home just yet. Um, that's a free advising service that you can schedule with Efficiency Works just to answer any questions. Like, want to learn about the program, want to learn about electrification, anything like that. And uh, you know, we we understand that you know, as as Josh was saying, this is it's a journey, and you can't do everything at once. So our program is there to help and help guide a customer sort of make those decisions and, and map out that journey and how it works for them. Um, I'd like to say, in, in Longmont in 2022, we did a 126 assessments last year uh, in Longmont Learn. We'll, we'll be looking to push that in 2023. Next is our rebate and retrofit program. So this is a market rate program available to all of our customers. Um, it's where I'm gonna spend the bulk of the rest of my time talking about what changes we're making in 2023. So I won't get into that just yet, but just to note that uh, um, this is a program that we need to use one of our service providers um, and you know that, that sort of the rebate is uh, given to that service provider which is then passed on to the customer, so the customer would see that rebate on the bill for the work that they've done in their home. Uh, in 2022, we were able to do 146 projects in Longmont, 
and we were able to give out $85,000 of rebates in 2022. Uh, further to that, we also gave out uh, $5,200 of efficiency kits to our customers. Also, let me push that number in 2023. Mm -hmm. Um, and then lastly is our income qualified program. So our income qualified program is only for eligible customers who have uh, an average household income of 8% or less of the AMI for Larimer County or Boulder County uh, or for Longmont. This is a no cost to the customer program. So this uh, has advising services, assessments, and retrofit rebates in the home of the customer. Um, like I said, it's, it's a no cost to the customer uh, we were able to do 103, uh, serve 103 homes across our four owner communities in 2022. We're looking to push that number to uh, 150 to 250 customers in 2023, and then 2024 onwards, looking for 250 plus customers going forward. We partner with Energy Outreach Colorado to implement this program, and we're also expanding the rebate measures that we're offering in 2023. All right, let's get into sort of the rebates and what things are changing, what we're offering. So we're making some significant changes to our, our rebate uh, measures in, in 2023. These are going to go live on the 1st of April, so next month. And um, it's going to be focusing on, on building electrification. So historically, there have been some um, gas rebates. It's going to be all electric rebates going forward. Um, we're going to be expanding our incentives on heat pumps and the tiers that we're offering, heat pump water heaters, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, and as well as our uh, insulation and envelope, uh, insulation and air sealing and envelope and windows measures. We also be adding trade incentives. So we're using trade incentives going forward to help and prime the market for certain measures such as air source heat pumps to help the, uh, help the service provider you know, put some money where he needs to sort of push that product with our customers. So there'll be a rebate portion for both the, uh, the customer and for the, the service provider. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick note on, on a bonus rebate that we're currently running. It's been going on since about October last year. So this is a triple rebate where a customer would receive triple the existing rebate for air sealing and insulation, heat pumps, water heaters, uh, ductless mini splits and smart thermostats. This ends on the 30th of September this year. Uh, one needs like it needs to be an eligible customer, like I said, purchasing power from Long One Power and Communications, and it's an all-electric bonus, meaning that at the time of application, the customer does not have a natural gas meter connected to the home. We have, however, allowed propane customers to take part. Just as we've seen in our areas, propane customers don't have as much access to rebates as both natural gas and electric customers. So we decided to guide that journey to allow propane customers as well. All right, uh, it's gonna get into now the, the new rebates that we're gonna be offering in 2023. These are gonna go, like I said, live 1st of April. Um, there's quite a bit of detail here in the measure guidelines. I'll touch on some of it, and if you have more questions, please feel free to ask afterwards. But Starting with heat pump water heaters, we have an $800 customer rebate and a $200 trade incentive for a compliant water heater. These are replacement situation. Uh, there's no maximums, so homes with multiple heat pump water heater requirements can take part in all of them, uh, as well as an extra $100 to the customers for heat pump water heaters with a communicating device. On. So that is an ECO port, a CTA 2045. Uh, they don't need to be connected to anything at this time. They just need to be uh, provided with an air source heat pump. All right. Air source heat pumps. So those of you heat pumps that Josh is talking about, your uh, ducted heat pumps with your outdoor unit vented to the inside. Uh, we have two tiers. We have tier one uh, is a $1,500 rebate to the customer, a $200 trade incentive to the service provider. Um, the efficiency spec is there, 16 CO9 HSPF. These need to have a changeover temperature of 35 degrees Fahrenheit or less. So these are um, set up in a way where they can be dual fuel, um, but they need to have that changeover temperature at 35 degrees Fahrenheit or less. The second tier is a cold climate heat pump. These have a $2,000 rebate and a $300 trade incentive. As you can see, the efficiency specs are not that different to tier one. However, this is a cold climate certified heat pump. 
uh, and that means that that heat pump is certified, I believe, to uh, run at 75% of its capacity at five degrees Fahrenheit or less, at a minimum, um, and those would need to be certified for one of the four certified bodies, such as NEE, CDE, Energy Star, AHRI. And like I said, that change over temperature needs to be recorded upon installation, uh, installation at five degrees Fahrenheit or less. Ground source heat pumps, I'll breeze through this one quite quickly. We actually never remade a ground source heat pump in our program. A pretty expensive system, so hopefully that can change with a $3,000 rebate for the customer and a $300 trade incentive uh, for the installing contractor. Ductless mini splits. So we've changed up a little bit this year. We used to pay per head. We decided that it's more flexible to pay per ton. So we're paying $500 per ton for our ductless mini splits that are needed to call the climate. So you can see they've got a high efficiency spec, 21 sera, 9.5 HSPM. It's very easy for ductless mini splits to meet that. Um, and that per ton value just makes the, the rebate more flexible. Uh, we've also decided that we'll, we'll round up to the closest half ton. So not all systems are a perfect ton. You install a 1.2 ton system, there'll be a $750 rebate to the customer. Uh, and you'll see no trade, no trade incentive there. And that's because we're selling these very well in our market currently, we rebate them a lot. There isn't really a need to sort of prime our service providers to leave our already um, Central air conditioners, there were three tiers. Previously, from April 1st, there will only be one tier. We're keeping that third tier, nothing's really changed there. We're just keeping this rebate in a transitional phase for that customer who's not necessarily ready for, to move forward with the heat pump. There's still an option on the table. Uh, moving into our uh, thermal envelope rebates windows. Um, sort of hard to tell what the price difference is there being at a square foot, but we've increased all our thermal envelope rebates by 40%. So they used to be 40% lower dollar per square foot on windows, and there used to, used to be a, a maximum cutoff for the amount of square feet that you could apply for a rebate on. We've removed that maximum to uh, make more dollars available to the customers and increased it by 40%. Air sealing, Joshua was referring to with you know, having your blower door test performed, it's a test before and a test afterwards, and it measures your reduction uh, in leakage, and the, the higher tier you fall into, the higher the rebate will be, goes across the board, because it means increased by 40% from what's currently offered. And lastly, insulation, same thing again here, it's a 40% increase across all these rebates, uh, all these insulation measures, a lot of them are, you know, on a per square foot or linear foot basis. Um, yeah, so these have all been uh, increased by 40% and it just, uh, you know, we feel that if a customer is looking to electrify their home, make uh, HVAC changes to their home, we want them to be able to set that home up for success, meaning that address any leakage or insulation issues in their home. So by putting dollar amounts uh, to those measures, we feel that we can help customers make that choice when deciding to electrify them. And uh, I've left a little QR code here on the left. If anyone wants to snap a, a picture of that, that'll take you to our website where all of our rebates exist. Um, and yeah, there will be questions at the end. Yeah, great. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We also have a link to their website on our sustainable resilient loan on the website too. So I'm going to be talking about the long months advanced metering infrastructure, AMI we call it. Um, it's basically a system of uh, communication to all the meters and then all the meters communicating back to, a, to our system to be able to do the billing. Um, this shows what long, long kind of a, a diagram of how long my system will work. Um, um, so a long one we have, uh, Longma currently has about almost 50,000 meters um, spread throughout the city limits and all the way up along uh, around lines. The electric meters that are in place currently are pretty old meters. They're, they've been there for, some have been there for quite a few decades, really. Um, the meters here that we're showing um, are a communicating meter. They have a little radio in them. 
they they communicate to each other and then they work their reading the, the information back to our billing center here so a meter will um, throughout the city will go back to different components in the in the in the system and then over uh, we'll take advantage of the existing fiber that's throughout the city and bring those that information back to our, our billing department over here um, this this system is going in currently we, we're looking at 50,000 meters and maybe about 13 gateways and about 25 routers to get all this information back to our billing department for, for bills um, the gateways within Longmont we've had a, uh, a uh, emergency tower system that was put in years ago but a lot of the towers still exist so we're going to be using those towers to be putting our uh, gateways on uh, for, to collect all the, the meter reads um, throughout town um, there are about 25 routers and um, we'll take advantage of, of, of fiber throughout the city to get all those meter reads back to the, the billing department So this, this kind of shows where the AMI system will work with um, other systems, including home energy management and building energy management systems within town. Could be a, could be a residential building or a, a business. Um, within, a, within a residence or a, a, a business, that you have all kinds of electric loads that are, that are um, happening inside there. Some energy management systems will work with the meter and get whole house information and then um, and then all the lows within that um, that house and the even PV or whatever is going to be going on inside the a, a business or a house will be connected to a, a home energy management network um, and then work with the meter um, on the outside of the house to be able to get whole whole house information and do a, a, a good energy management of when things turn on when things go uh, turn off when things should um, maybe uh, be curtailed and and um, and and be um, just a better energy management system within the facility kind of in this scenario we got water electrical water heaters EV chargers uh, PV uh, smart thermostat and um, we're showing a low switch here if you have some kind of device like a like a pool pool pumps or heat pumps or other things that you could manage with the, the whole energy management system in the building and then the, the utility also participates in that we with with the AMI system we we can also send pricing signals back to the customer when are when are energy prices really high when are energy prices low when do we have wind and, and, and solar available when do we not have those available and when can we we uh, push some of the uh, the load to different times of the day These are some of the, the, the uh, highlights of, of, of AMI systems. Um, but one of the big things here is the, the ability to, for our customers to look at their energy usage throughout the day. So um, currently, a customer gets a bill at the end of the month, and that's the only time you know how much energy you use and what the bill is. With an AMI system, you can look through a, a web portal and see what, what your energy usage is throughout the day, throughout a month. You can compare it to last month or last year You'll have all that information available um, on, on the energy usage within the home, all electricity usage. The AMI system allows for uh, real-time information about how energy is flowing throughout the system. Currently, we 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 really don't know what's going on. We we, we deliver energy, uh, consumers use it, and we really don't know until the end of the month where how much energy was used and where it went. With the uh, AMI system, we have real-time. Um, um, monitoring of all that energy that's flowing throughout the system and through every customer. Cut loads versus generation, so this is where PRPA, we get all our, uh, Longmont gets all our uh, load or uh, generation from uh, Flat River Power Authority. Um, there's a, so matching the loads to the generation is where um, AMI system will, will give us all the information about all the all the loads that are going out. Where is where is it going? Who's using it? What parts of the city are using more? And how commercial are using versus uh, residential? Customer engagement. Uh, this is where customers can can monitor their own energy usage. They can look at it every what's what what in their house is using the most energy. What's what, how can they they uh, maybe uh, sort of 
tailor their energy uses throughout a day so that um, in the future when when uh, renewals, more renewables are available or when um, the, um, lower price energy is available, customers can kind of tailor how they use their energy in their house. Same with this aggregation, we'll know where which parts of the community are using energy, which which how are the how is the res the commercial district using energy, how is residential uh, using energy. We'll know that through AMI and that we really don't have that kind of information right now. And then electric system optimization. So currently we when we design an electric system, the, the, the power lines, the transmit the uh, transformers, the switches, everything we have in the electric system, we 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 use a lot of, of, of uh, methods to, to size the stuff, but with AMI we'll really be able to tailor our electric system and uh, be really efficient with how we buy equipment and transformers and everything that gets uh, electric, to, electric to, the, to the customers. Outage restoration is kind of a biggie, so right currently when parts of the city, uh, a, a power line gets, a tree goes in the power line or an animal or something happens to a power line, we we, um, we kind of rely on customers to call in and tell us, you know, I'm, I'm without power. But with an AMI system, we, the, the meters will tell us which parts of town are having problems and where power outages are. Um, and then and then we can restore the power much more quickly so we know exactly where the outage is and where the problem is with AMI. Power quality, that's um, mostly businesses are concerned with power quality. Blinks and, and voltage sags and swells and Different different things affect um, equipment that that customers are using. So power quality is um, something that the AMI system will tell us. You know how to how to make that power the best available for the, for the commercial customers. Move ins or move outs. So AMI meters um, have the ability to for us to be able to, to uh, when a customer calls in and they're moving out, we can without sending a person out to the uh, to the meter to do a do a turn off or a turn on. We can do that kind of remotely turn on and turn off and customize the the uh, turn on and turn off from the office without sending people off every time uh, some of the moves. Prepaid metering is 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 uh, is an is a ability to do that uh, with AMI. It's the idea where a customer can can pay in advance for how much energy they're gonna use throughout per month. Pay in advance and mostly it's for like um, um, Apartments, people that move in and out quite a bit, like a, like a, around a college or apartment buildings and things like that, where they don't really have to pay for uh, put a deposit down. They can pay a certain amount of money, and the meter will turn on. And then when that amount of money runs off, it'll turn off. And then they get some more money. They can put they can reload it again and, and, and pay as you go. It's kind of a pay as you go system. Great program. So. Um, once AMI is, is in place, we, we'll know how energy is used throughout the day. Um, we'll have kind of pricing signals for when, when renewables are available, when, uh, when, they're, when they're not available, when, when we're using more expensive uh, resources, Black River's putting on gas, uh, any kind of different resources, they might be more, more expensive, so customers can look at, look at those rate programs and when, when energy is the cheapest and be able to Use their their uh, appliances and and maybe preheat their house or turn on the water heater when it's cheaper and then turn things off when, when uh, the price of energy is higher. That's kind of the idea of customer rate programs for, for different uh, scenarios. Uh, so with AMI, we're going to have this customer web portal um, where customers can go online and look at their actual meter usage, the, what's going on in, at their house. So uh, web portal would allow, um, with AMI, we're going to be kind of sampling the meter, the uh, usage throughout about a day. And with that kind of sampling, the customer would go out there and look at how much they use hour by hour or day by day or year by year and, and see a profile and, and kind of be able to look at that and, and, and uh, see how they're using energy. You know, why is it, why am I high on the weekends or why am I low uh, during holidays and that kind of thing. Uh, that that's available. That will be available as soon as we get all the AMI system in place and kind of all the integration and the, the uh, web the web portal uh, design from from our our, uh, our system. Down here, I mean, with AMI, you know, we will be able to look at a history of, of a customer has a you know 
concern or a question about why is my bill high or why am I uh, uh, different questions about their their bill their usage. Our our customer service department can actually look at that usage um, online and and while the customer's looking at it and kind of go through and, and do some troubleshooting online and then provide some recommendations on energy conservation based on how they see their their usage going. Last but not least, Nigel Z, and he is a lifetime EV educator. Um, <clears throat> he was at our EV fair, I know, a couple years ago, and I was very impressed with Nigel. He, he works with EV Transform Motion. He's a coach with Drive Electric Colorado. Um, Nigel is a driving force in the EV education industry, and he's a resource for all things EV. So, <laughs> welcome to Nigel. Hi, Dad. Hi. Um, before I start um, with the techie side of it, this is low, low tech. Uh, I made this map, made this map uh, and I drew a, 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 a circle around Denver, and this is 160 miles. One of the biggest things with EVs is people worried about range anxiety. Uh, and but how far can I go? Well, that's 160 miles and take you to the Kansas border. Uh, we're only a, uh, 380 miles wide by 280 miles deep. Uh, but that's how far you go. Obviously, that's just a pro flies with perfect weather conditions, but that's, most cars do 250 miles. And so I find that visualizing things makes it an awful lot easier than, uh, you know, just saying, well, you can go this far. And you look at that and how, how often do you go that far? And that, that's the key to the thing. Uh, some people will say, well, I, once a year I go uh, on a, uh, uh, a road trip, or a two week road trip, okay? Um, but for that two weeks, why not rent a gasoline car until you're comfortable with your electric car? But why would you not buy an electric car for the sake of that yeah. once or twice a year when you go on a road trip? So that's, that's putting that up there. Now, this is, uh, we're Drive Electric Colorado, which is part of Drive Clean Colorado. And uh, is this just the right hand button here? Uh, the down button. Okay. Down here. The down button. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, what are we? Uh, well, um, we understand all of the uh, uh, initiatives that are going on. We are a not for profit. Uh, there are drive electrics and drive cleans across the country, drive clean Oklahoma and places like that. And, uh, and this funding comes through um, the Department of Energy. Uh, to get the message out. So we're a, a, a one-stop shop. Uh, we are, we're very we're unbiased, we're uh, agnostic. Uh, we are we like every, every, everything electric. It's not just cars, we always talk about cars, uh, but it's electric bikes, micro-mobility. Um, most of the year here, we could use a bike. And there are so many cool bike rides here. Just marvelous, one from Boulder down to, uh, uh, up to Longmont, delightful ride. So, you know, it's not just about electric cars. Um, we talk about the benefits of EVs, and what we do is we have a lot of the volunteers. Um, it's difficult to get the dealerships out because a lot of the events are on a, uh, on a Saturday, and they won't give up a car or a salesperson on a Saturday. And on a Sunday, it's their day off, so they won't come out, generally. Uh, and so it's a lot of volunteers. And the, the nice thing about volunteers is that we are, I mean, I'm a car salesman, right? Sorry, <laughs> but uh, for my sins. But um, like for 15 years, so I, I've been selling electric cars since 2009, and I just love any electric car. Don't care what it is, I just love electric cars. It's just fun. It's like, do you remember the first day you learned to drive, and you passed your test, and you got the car on your own? No one was sitting in the passenger seat, and um, but I was whooping at the top of my and that, like grinning from ear to ear, and I would go anywhere. My mom wanted me to go and get milk, get shot, go get Never mind. And as we get older, it gets to be more of a chore uh, and not so much fun. And then you suddenly, um, you know, you get out and uh, in an electric car, and there's it's, it's just something about it. It's like, it's like a magic carpet. There's no gears, and so it just goes. It's quick. It's quiet. It's smooth. Uh, it's so inexpensive. Uh, for instance, and this is one of the things I'll point out, and then I'll carry over this. Uh, I'm a bit all over the place with things. Um, 
my car, 62 kilowatt battery, right? If I was to run my battery to empty, now I'm with XL Energy, so on the worst day, I'd pay 11 cents a kilowatt hour. So that would be 11 cents multiplied by 62, which is $6.82 to get 220 miles of range out of my car. I mean, that's a gallon and a half. I mean, from that perspective, it's just, it's, it's not great. Right. Uh, where people are thinking about, well, can I afford to get an electric gasoline car? Well, if you're not buying, spending 300 bucks a month on gasoline, you could be putting out your payment of the car, or some of that. Uh, but the savings are phenomenal, and of course, there's very little maintenance with them as well. And there's the grin factor, which is also a big part of it. <laughs> um, so we also know about the, as much as we can right now, the financial incentives of state, uh, uh, um, uh, could, uh, could have yeah? No, that would be Platte River. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a bit weird right now because we have the Inflation Reduction Act, but a uh, great idea, personally, a bit poorly executed. So, I mean, I guess. Um, but we could have done a better job with that. Uh, and so it's a bit of a mess right now. So we have to be careful about what we say about where you can get this because it depends where the battery comes from, where the chemicals come from, and the minerals come from in the battery, and where was it. Uh, uh, you know, where was it assembled and things like that. So that's a, a, a bit of a tough one right now, so you've got to be really careful there. Charging, three different ways of charging. Level one is your 110 plug socket at home. Um, slow, but it works, because you're not draining the battery. But if you're draining the battery every day, you sold you one car. Uh, the reality is that, okay, let's say we do 50 miles in a day, and you plug that car in at nine o'clock at night, time of use, things like that, saves money, uh, and then, you find that it puts three to five miles for every hour you charge it. So you know, over 10 hours, it's between 30 and 50 miles back into the car. So I felt since 2009, I've been using a, uh, a 110 plug socket, but now we have two EVs, uh, and my kid's doing 100 miles a day to school back. So um, he's got my car, and I've got mine now. Um, <laughs> that's what happens. Um, and so, the 110 has worked just fine, but there are little things that you need to find out, get an electrician in, is it aluminium wiring, which mine was, and uh, things like that. Is there a microwave on the same circuit? Not very good. Uh, is it grounded? Uh, that's level one. Level two is your washer dryer. It's the same price between the level one and level two, 110 and 220, 240. So it doesn't matter which one it is you use. 240 is gonna give you 20 to 25 miles or more for every hour you charge it. So that's how we, we uh, talk about it, is miles per hour of charge. Um, so if your car was completely empty, generally most cars would be completely full, and that's assuming you run into empty in seven hours, okay? and then it's done, so while you're sleeping again, or while you're at work, or while you're shopping, or whatever it is. Um, level three is your DC three-phase fast charger, 480 volts. Um, there's a lot of them around, you know, people say, well, there's not really enough infrastructure. Well, firstly, every building has plugs, so there is infrastructure. But if we're talking about level three charging, actually fast charging from, say, 15% to 80% in 25 minutes. Uh, it'll slow down after 80% because then the battery starts to get warmer and heat is a killer of battery, so it manages the heat for the last 80%, the, the last 20%. Um, Really, most people don't use it that much. We push it very hard, but level two and level one in apartments and places like that, it's, it's a way less expensive. And you can have a whole bank of level two chargers for the price of one level three charger. So there are places where level three is good on freeways. There's 70 to 80 to 90. Um, I've driven a, a Nissan Leaf, which only is, is an air-cooled battery, so it doesn't go, it'll go, and then you can only charge it twice, and then the battery gets so hot cooling itself down, so you have to spend overnight somewhere. Uh, but I drove the way to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It was a journey, but it was, I visited a lot of uh, Walmart. I spent a lot of Walmart. <laughs> Ooh, I need that. Um, and then the EVs that are available. There's a lot more of them turning up. Finally, the industry has woken up to it, uh, so we are getting there with that. It's a bit, um, it's a bit of a weird thing. There's two different price sections, right? There's a $70,000, cars, which is not most of us, and then there's a 40000 or less, which is most of us, but they're building a lot of the fancy ones, 0 to 60 in 1.9 seconds, like, um, <laughs> you know, certain things like, yes, it's lovely, but where are you going to use it, things like that, but not with granny in the back, that's for sure. Um, but most of us are, like, uh, you know, 35 and less, uh, and, that, and that's a low-hanging fruit of EV, 
EV adoption, like fleets, EV adoption. But we're not making many vans right now. Where's our minivans? Where's our little electric Honda Elements or our Ford Flex? The quirky looking vehicles that haul a lot of stuff in them, as opposed to there's lots of sneak, fast back, five seat, four door sedans, which is not what everyone wants. We need stuff to schlack things around. <laughs> All right, so um, we, there's a website we have, which is uh, uh, driveelectriccolorado.org, uh, and that's about everything on it, so I can tell you about rebates, cars are available. Uh, there is another one, which is called EV Colorado, which is from the Colorado Energy Office. It's basically the same sort of information, just different format. But that's what, those are the two best places for getting a lot of information. YouTube, <laughs> honestly, YouTube, you'll get to. The thing about us being volunteers and going out and talking to people is like, we're just excited about our cars. We just want to tell people about it. We don't want to sell it. Uh, it may work for you or it may not work for you. But if we educate you well, uh, we pollinate you. And now we send you out to pollinate others. Uh, and that's what it is. We're pollinators. Um, <laughs> and someone had a car with a bee. Has one of you got a little car with a bee sticker on it? <laughs> so, outside. <laughs> All right. Um, what is Drive Electric Colorado? So yeah, we're part of Drive Clean Colorado. Um, and so we go, we have coaches, we're all volunteers, and we go out and talk about our vehicles and other people's vehicles. But we talk about the nuances of it. We're not talking about how fast it goes or the size of the motor and things like that. We're talking about the nuances of, oh, well, if your battery is 100% full and you're at the top of a mountain and you come down that mountain and you put it into its eco mode, there's no eco mode because there's nowhere for that electricity to go to. So it won't automatically regen and slow the car down because unless the battery is emptied out a little bit, there's no room for it to do any regen. Now, that's like a little weird nuance of it. Or how do the heaters work? Well, the heaters on most of them are resistive heating. So it's a barium titanate ceramic rod. We just put a current through it, it's super hot, then we blow air over it. It's a hairdryer. <laughs> right? um, and there are different types, there's hybrids, and now they're starting to bring ones out that have uh, a fluid in them, that they heat up a fluid like a kettle. Um, so there's lots of different little, little weird things that you wouldn't necessarily get told by the salespeople, and that's obviously a whole other issue is um, our sales force. <laughs> EVs, if you know what I mean. Um, what else we got? So our goal is just to get as many people in, into cars, just to drive them. You know, go and drive with you. And if you were, if you were even thinking about it, and you can't drive with us, go, go either go to a dealership or go and rent one for the day. You know, fifty bucks, go and rent a Tesla or whatever, and drive it and see what it feels like. Because no one ever got out of the car when I was selling cars and said, "Yeah, that's rubbish." And no one. I mean, people just grin from ear to ear. And that's one way of doing it. Um, so we just want to get as many people into cars, EVs as we can. Um, and we're, we, our age group, and one age group below us, the main people that are buying them, right? It's not my kid, my kid's just a one. But um, that's the thing. So we're pushing it. You know, we're the ones moving it along. I have customers. I have a, a gentleman. He's a 96 year old astrophysicist and uh, tiny, tiny man. He's, he's like the size of my mind, like four foot something. Uh, but he's pretty brilliant, and he's a lovely man, and he just goes everywhere. Absolutely everywhere in the TV. Because people always said, well, it's only for young people. No, it's everywhere. When I first started, it was all people from this, Noah, and Rail, and Carlton, Carlton, all the technology guys. And they'd be asking me things, and I'd be like, oh, and I was a tester at the time when we had just the road stuff. And, and I had to learn to understand what they were talking about. And then I realized, well, I need to take that geek speak and convert geek speak into something that we can all understand. We just, you know, just. Is it simply explained to you? So anyway, that's one of the things we do. We do these events. We did a fantastic one with the Sustainable Water Group in uh, London. You can see. Uh, yeah. um, did I say that right? Yeah. Some <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, driveelectriccolorado.org is a really smashing website. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's briefly talk about EVs. Yes, no engine noise. And of course, there are people who come up and say, well, I love the sound of a V8. Well, so do I, but I'm old, right? And when I die, um, that dies with me because my kid doesn't care. And there will always be petrol heads, there will always be gearheads, but it's a very small community. And when you go to a Cars and Coffee now, there's all these fantastic old vehicles. Do you ever go to the one in Lafayette? 
right? So you go there, and because uh, there's all these old fantastic cars, um, and in 30 years' time, people are going to be pulling in their vintage Nissan Leaf. And going, well, well, I'm driving a, a, a gasoline motor tonight. Or, 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 or another way around. Um, yeah, heavy batteries, uh, low to the ground. I raced my Leaf at Vanderbilt and just smoked everything else that we were racing against for like 350 turbo diesel and everything. Um, then I raced it at um, uh, Colorado National Speedway. We were doing 85 around the bends, and it just, it's like it's on rails, it's like a slot car, um, but I had through a set of tires. That's the only possible downside. If you're a bit of a spirited driver, and you drive it like you stole it, you can do two a set of tires if you don't have to take it. Um, let's see, so yes, it can save you save money, right? Because it's like, okay, it's, uh, eight bucks. Even if you go and use a level three charger, a DC fast charger, the, the most expensive ones are about 43 bucks, about 43, 43 cents a kilowatt hour. So you could spend 20 bucks, 25 bucks to fit a car with 250 miles of charge. <laughs> Um, but that's not stuff that we do very often. We're usually using, like, if I go to the Museum of Nature and Science, they got a whole bank of level twos downstairs completely free. So I just go down there and charge up while we're wandering around. Right? Um, and you'll get to know where your favorite charging stations are. Right? Um, very little maintenance. Uh, battery inspection once a year, uh, tire rotation every six months. But if, if, again, if you're spirited, probably every three months is a good idea. But you've got to be careful because some of the cars have a slightly wider tire at the back than the front. So you can't rotate them, you can only go to crossways or replace them. I know, don't ask me why they do it, but they do it. Um, that's about the only other things washer fluid, in cabin air filter once a year. So if you ever buy one and they say, well, we should send you a maintenance package, and don't buy it. You don't need that. The only thing you need to get if you ever buy one is a windshield replacement uh, and key replacement. Keys are really expensive. But windshields, people say, oh, my AAA will handle that. Well, the only thing with that is it doesn't pay for recalibration because they've all got cameras on them now. So you can end up with 1,500 button bill for the windshields and uh, recalibration. So it's well worth it. You've only got to bust one or two windshields and you can use pay for yourself. So they're that one point. And get gap insurance. If you're financing it, have gap insurance. Right, for the sake of 10 bucks a month, it's the best thing you can ever do. Do you know what gap is? No. Okay. So let's say you've got a loan on your car and um, you, you have an accident and the car gets towed from the insurance company. You go, oh, really sorry about that, um, but glad you're okay. Here's a check for $15,000. You go, wait, I owe 25. And they go, what's shame? We think it's worth 15. So now you're on the hook for 10 grand. If you have gap insurance, it pays the difference between what the insurance company pays you and what you actually owe on that car. If you lease a car, it automatically is built into it, but otherwise it isn't. And that's the best money you could ever spend. I had one customer, I walked into my store one day, and there's a customer who's writing a check for $7,000. And I said, hey, you know, what you doing? He said, oh, well, my car got totaled and I didn't have didn't a gap, and my heart sunk, and I thought, oh my God, did I not talk about that? <laughs> and, and I just, I was scared to ask, but I had to say it. I said, did I not tell you that about that? He says, oh yeah. He said, well, could have, should have, would have. And he's like, yeah, you had to write a $7,000 check, whereas it would cost you 10 bucks a month to have had gap insurance. So if you get a car, that's what you need to do. Um, yes, they're clean, nothing comes out of them. Yes, there's what's called the long tail pipe, what comes out of the power station at the other end of it, which is true, but we can mitigate what comes out of that power station. Whereas, when I'm sitting in traffic, there's nothing coming out of my car at all. Um, and just to give you an idea, uh, one gallon of gasoline weighs six and quarter pounds. If you burn it in the gasoline engine, it produces 19 pounds of CO2. Right. What does 19 pounds of CO2 look like? Well, it's six foot by six foot by four foot, not a cube, uh, rectangle. Um, that's just one, right? 60,000 cars come into Boulder every day. If every one of them just put one gallon of gasoline each, that means we've produced 1,160,000 pounds of CO2, which in tons is uh, about 500 something tons of CO2. What does a ton of CO2 look like? Well, if it was a yoga board, it would be 33 feet in diameter. Or 28 foot by 28 foot by 28 foot. And that's just one journey, right? 200,000 cars coming to uh, Denver every day. And that's two, twice a day, right? So they're coming in and they're going out. So it's massive amounts of CO2. So we're not putting any of that out into the atmosphere. Um, instant torque, which is quite a lot. Uh, regen braking, which is lovely to see power coming back to this car. Like if you go up into the mountains 
and you go up to uh, the tunnels, yes, you're pulling more power coming out of the, uh, going up the hill. Um, but as soon as you get to the top of the hill, you put it back in, uh, if you're coming down, you put it into its regen mode, its brake mode, and then you just see it regening power and the miles going back up and it's putting power back into the car. It's so cool. Um, and, um, well, new technology. It depends what you want in way of new technology. A lot of people say to me, well, I'm just going to wait a little while longer for, you know, technology is always getting better. Which bit? What you're waiting for is you don't have, we have the batteries that do more than 300 miles on a charge. Uh, and we also have um, electric motors. Well, I have a, a radon system in my house that's been running for 19 years on the, on the same motor. They don't really fail. So, you know, where do we draw the line in technology? If it's screens that you love, great. Uh, personally, I'm not a lover of the screens. Um, okay, tax credits. Um, so, yeah, 2,000 for a new EV, um, uh, 1,500 on a two-year lease. Leases are not great right now, but lease deals aren't great, so you should look into that because it doesn't necessarily make sense to be leasing something right now. And they just don't have the money factors in them that they used to have. Federal tax credits up to 7,500, but we're not accountants, right? So when your salesperson says you've got 7,500 in federal taxes, yeah, only if you have paid 7,500 in federal taxes, you don't owe them. You owe them something, they're going to take out what you owe them and then send you back the rest. But you've got to be careful now because some of them, because of the batteries and where the batteries are made and the minerals are in the batteries, you may not get all of it yet. So be careful with that as well. Um, to give you an idea, I bought Chevy Bolt. Right, that car is twenty-seven and a half thousand dollars before tax and such. Right. On top of that, if you say you're in Costco, they take five hundred bucks off. If you're an Uber driver, they do in a thousand bucks. You could have 2,000 state tax credit taken off at source if you pay them 150 bucks, but this is worth it if you want to keep the payment down. And then the up to 7,500. So that, if you were asking me, which you're not, uh, again, but if you're asking me what's, what's a really inexpensive but efficient vehicle, that would be the one. And I'm not, not selling Chevy Bolts. Uh, I mean, I've been selling Leafs for 14 years, and I love them all, but I, I'm a I guess a simple man. I don't need fancy stuff in my car. It just does everything that I like. It's really nice. So, you know, uh, if you need all-wheel drive, then you need to start. They're all going to be in the high 40s and into the 50s, so you have to decide on what it is that you want out of the car, what you want to spend, what you want monthly payment to be, are you trading in the car, things like that. Um, so that's a lot of the tax credits. Now, I think this might say Excel is on my pocket. Um, but yeah, there are lots of different things. That, who, do, who does what? Let's take that away. Did you want to say it? <laughs> um, you know, do they have something for wiring? Uh, I mean, I had aluminium wiring in my house. and uh, My house ended up costing me a lot more because aluminium wiring, the fuse box is right next to the sink in the laundry room. Uh, it can't be less than three feet away. So I said, well, what if I take the sink out? Well, that's great, but you've got the hot water boiler is still there. Oh, so what if I move the hot water boiler? Well, that's too much to do. Okay, and uh, also it's got the wrong piping on it, so we're going to have to put it in the basement now. Okay, how much is it going to be to, for me to just run this cable to my garage? $9,000. That was me, because it was an old house, and so these are things to take into account and be prepared for. Uh, generally, what you need uh, is if you have uh, a spare 50 amp breaker, so you need a 50 amp breaker if you're going to have level two charging. Um, then uh, and nothing else on it. Although there is, interestingly, a couple of companies that make a splitter. So if you have your washing machine in the, in, in the garage and uh, you can put a splitter into it and, and then you can plug in your washing machine on one side, your car on the other side, and then it knows which one to switch it to. <laughs> so that's one way of doing it. Um, and then it, the, all of these things, it just tells you how many miles, you know, five miles, 25, they can be faster now. Uh, most of the cars will come with a, a smart extension cord, which is when you plug into the wall and then you plug into the car, and it's got an adapter between a three pin plug and a, 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 a what's called a Nema 1450, which is the most popular plug for it. Um, but price wise, it's just, I mean, it's not even that. Um, so there's, there's not a lot of reason to not have one. And you just have to ask yourself the right questions. Do I like drive less than 200 miles a day? Can I plug in a home or work? And uh, if it's yes to both of those, then it will probably work for you unless you need a nine seat or something unusual that we're not making yet. Um, 
there, so 78,000 on the road, uh, plenty of level twos, uh, level threes are getting there. Um, I rarely use outside of my house, really. Uh, and I have a car salesman, so we do have to take the pictures <laughs> that I want to car salesman. But, um, yeah, but the uh, energy office is putting all these fast charges as well. Um, yeah, going there and figure out all the you know the myths uh, about things, what happens to the batteries. Uh, you know, what happens when it's no good in the car again? What, what does it cost for a new battery? Well, what's the cost of a new battery? Well, it's got a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty on it, so it's a bit like how long is a piece of string. Uh, who knows? In 10 years' time, no idea what it will cost. But it'll certainly be a lot less than it is now, and it won't be the chemicals that we have now. And when it's no good in a car anymore because it won't take it far enough, we'll take it out, put it into a building, use it to store our solar, and then we'll use it as backup power uh, if the power if we have a power outage. Or if we have a, a, a heavy load at our uh, at your factory or whatever, it will offset your peak charging. Um, and then after that, you take it to someone like Redwood Materials, who is a guy from Tesla, and what he does is he takes his batteries that still have a charge in them, and of course they have to take the charge out of them so they don't get themselves disbanded. Yeah? So they take that charge out, put it into a big battery, and use that charge to now dismantle the battery that they've just taken the charge out of. So what they'll do is they'll crush it up, put it into component parts, resell the component parts for anodes, cathodes, uh, and all the minerals that are in it, the aluminium, all of these different things. And so it is getting the full recycle. Uh, we can't be perfect about everything right now with, yes, where it's coming from, of course. Um, and I was spoke to dealerships and they said, well, you know, what about the environmental impact of it? And I'm just thinking, really? You're a car dealership, you never said anything about gasoline for the last <laughs> six years, and now you're suddenly worried about the impact on our environment. But um, it's an interesting, fantastic time to be alive. It really is a lot of time. This is like horse and cart, right? Going from horse and cart. And interestingly, uh, very quickly, because I know I'm talking a lot, um, when we went from horse and cart to uh, gasoline cars, people were just freaked out. Obviously, for the part of the first cars were electric. Uh, Henry Ford's wife was driving an electric car, and she banned her from doing that. Um, and um, there's really cool ads for electric vehicles a long time ago. But what they had is because people couldn't have the fact that there was no horse in front of them. So they made what was called a horsey horse. Have you ever heard of a horsey horse? Maybe you should look it up, right? But what it was, is it was like a little statue of horses backside in front of you, right? So that you felt reassured that you were seeing a horse. <laughs> so maybe with electric cars now, we'll make this little fake gasoline motor will stick on the front of so <laughs> <laughs> so All the cars are now, now, now making gasoline, you know, gasoline sounds that will make an electric car sound like a gasoline car. Right? <laughs> yeah, those little CO2 containers, so in case you're not putting enough CO2 in there, just, just squirt some in the air. <laughs> Feel, feel good. Um, anyway, that's us. Um, I've jammed a lot into it. Uh, you're welcome to contact me. I'm sure they've got my contact information. If you've got questions or anything, stuff like that. But yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we have time for a couple minute break, and we'll get set, set up for Q and A, and get everybody back up, and you can ask me any questions because. <clears throat> Multiple folks can raise their hand up here and answer the question as well. And I think quite often there's definitely some overlap between disciplines. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's raise your hand and uh, go ahead. Um, this is for Efficiency Works. Um, how do we find out what uh, service providers you work with? Um, sure. So you can go on our, our website, efficiencyworks.org. And from there, it can take you to a list of all our service providers. You can filter for uh, any of the owner communities. Um, Rommont, Loveland, Estes Park, Fort Collins. You can filter for trades, and you can filter by zip code, or you can filter by sort of just a mileage area to find the service providers. Um, just to add to that as well, it will give you the number of jobs that that service provider has performed uh, in, our, in our program as well. Next. I don't know if anybody from the city knows the answer to this, but uh, I saw that there was a rebate for installing a um, car charger in your, like in your garage, but it has to be permanently installed, Energy Star, and the um, Wi-Fi connected. 
And my question is, what's the, why is there a requirement to have it permanently installed versus the ones you can just plug into the 220 output? And do you, I, maybe this is something you all are set um, to answer. I'm going to hazard a guess here. Our EV charging person um, isn't here this evening, but I'll check with her. But I would imagine it's if we're going to pay a rebate, we don't want you to get the rebate and move to Boulder or Lafayette or something like that. We don't want you to be using that here in our And the reason that we want it to be Wi Fi enabled is um, not that we want to be able to talk with you now. But in the future, you know, Mike talked about some of the capabilities that we're going to have in the future with our AMI, AMI metering. Um, we might want to be able to talk with you about when the best time it is for you to use your charger, when it might be less expensive for you and for us. So. I guess I just always thought that if, if it was a program installed, if I took a trip to somebody's house that had a same kind of plug in their garage, I could take it with me. And, plug it in their garage and use it there too versus I wouldn't be able to do that as permanently as well. Yeah, or you could just move away. <laughs> and then we blast it. <laughs> Could I ask a question? <laughs> as is for you, Mike. Um, will there be an option for you to be able to send a, a text to someone's phone saying, hey, in two minutes time it's going to be cheaper for you to use your washing machine or your plug in or something. So when your rates change, yeah, I think that's where where we're going with that. I, um, the the time-based pricing is built on my area, and and the, the signal to the customer when when the rates are changing, um, that that's part of the part of the whole the whole network of things that we'll be doing. So time-based pricing is a big thing because um, the price of energy changes throughout the day. We and then throughout the seasons, mm -hmm. um, right? Currently, we don't really we don't really ch adjust rates too much based on that, but it really does it changes a lot. Like that river, when we got um, when, when when we got peak periods, um, they they bring on different types of generation. Um, when renewables aren't available, you know, right, the price of energy um, changes too. So the, the signal to the customer will be go will, in some way. We'll get that signal of the price change uh, to the customers. Thank you. I have a follow-up to that. When is that program going to be online? <clears throat> well, so so the AMI system. I mean, we're we got to change 20, 000, 50 thousand meters. Um, we expect to, to change fifty thousand meters in um, in about a, a ten to twelve month period. We we just started replacing meters. Uh, we we did a pilot program. We replaced five hundred and eighty some meters already. Um, by that, um, we we're looking to, uh, to start the bulk. Of change outs in June. We'll have the meters, um, at least we 20,000 meters we'll have um, at the at the um, um, service center within the next month or so. And then the next 30,000 meters we'll get in shortly after that. Once we have 50,000 meters at the warehouse, then we can get our installer to come in and, and start installing. And they're gonna install bulk in installations. It, it's a contract uh, installer. Um, they, they will go as fast as they can and within a 12 month period, less than 12 months, we should have close to 50,000 meters of salt. Once the, the system is in place, then we can take a, we can start um, adding all kinds of features and benefits to that tool that AMI is. Great. Go ahead. Oh, okay, so um, I have one for the city and one for um, probably, uh, well, I'm not sure probably Josh or Susan. Um, the first one is for the city, the city of Denver is offering almost double the rebate for heat pumps that Longmont is. And so they're off, they're giving $3,500 back. I wonder if you're going to look at, you know, upping that. And the second one is uh, we're ready to go on a heat pump, all electric, but we're hesitant to move forward because we keep hearing that there's going to be more rebates. Uh, um, and incentives in later 2023 and then today I'm very upset to hear that Boulder is talking about 2024 and we're now hearing that those might not be retroactive to January 1st of this year you know if we move forward with the installation so who can we get that final answer from? So I can talk a little bit about to the, to the rebate dollar amount and how we came up with the dollar amount it's you know looking at you know what we've done historically in the past 
what we can do within our budgets to ensure that we can offer a program that's not going to run out of money. That allows our service providers to put confidence behind our rebates and they can continue to sell and uh, they can really change their business model so that they operate within our communities. Denver had a massive problem of selling out of their, their rebate dollars within three months last time and it was absolute chaos. It was time we would love to put more rebate dollars amount and we look to you know put like as much money as I can from our budgets to help our, our customers make that decision. Um, some of the other rebate dollars are amount we're referring to the, the IRA and when those funds will come. Fortunately, we're still in a bit of a, we have more questions than answers sort of space. I know that uh, the DOE is promising to give guidance to the uh, state uh, energy offices by July. And once those state energy offices have that information, they'll, they'll, be in, they'll then be able to start working with us to figure out how they're going dis, to uh, distribute those, those rebates. But are you hearing anything about it being retroactive to January 1st? It's not going to be retroactive. It's not going to be retroactive. So the only rebates available currently are the tax incentives. Um, and then there is a measured approach that one can do sort of a whole house rebate, judging on the reduction in your megawatt hour consumption. Um, but the the dollar amount for a rebate, I, don't, I do not believe that's going to be retroactively applied. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and they had the DOE present and they, they did mention that it's not going to be retroactive. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it would be great if it was. Thank you. Yeah. I'm looking into a heat pump as well. So I've already met with somebody in your place and um, I've got a small place. Is there a difference in brands really or is the most expensive like carrier just as good as The, the short view is I think there's lots of great heat pump companies out there. Carriers, top of the market. Bosch is great. We sell a lot of Mitsubishi systems. I think the one difference is you want to make sure you go with a variable speed unit, not a single stage or even two stage for the most part, just to get the, the best efficiency and, and functionality out of the system. But I think there's a lot that work. There's, there's other brands out there. Mr. Cool that um, local not low quality, but uh, not a known brand, hasn't been around for a long time, but the heat pump technology has just been around for long enough that almost all systems and almost all heat pumps, I think I recommend for most people. Um, how do we get more information about the rebates or incentives that are, you said there's Boulder County and state incentives coming at the, in the beginning of 2024? I hope I wasn't confusing about Boulder County. We've got someone from Boulder County sitting right behind you, but they've had, Boulder County has had heat pump rebates for several years now. And um, so those are available today, right, Matt? Yeah, so I, I just work on the commercial side. So if anyone works for a business that's thinking about putting in a heat pump, we just started offering those in January. Residential side, I'm not as familiar with, but. Um, if you want to contact me, I have a couple cards, and my colleague can provide any information for the residential heat pump side of things. And, and so do like those you, stack with the IRA and the LPC and the, you know all of the? They'll they'll stack with Boulder County and and efficiency works. Um, when we learn more about what's coming on the Inflation Reduction Act, Inflation Reduction Act through the state, we hope to be able to stack those as well. We're anticipating. The last the information I got is that they'll stack. Okay. Any other questions? So I actually I've got one for Nigel, and it ties back to the AMI, the metering. So what are cars going to be able to talk to <clears throat> these intelligent metering systems so that it can be pretty much a closed loop system where the you know the um, provider of the electricity like PRPA can send a signal and say, hey, electricity is a lot cheaper. Go ahead and start charging, and the car immediately start charging up. Right. I, I think that's going to be coming into the not too distant future because, they, well, first you've got Vita X, um, vehicle to grid, vehicle to building, uh, being able to use your car as a storage for your house so that uh, in a power outage you can actually literally power your house mm -hmm. and put it back through your, your system. Whereas right now there's things like the, the Ford, the Lightning, um, has a uh, power outlet. So you're not powering the whole house, but you could like with an extension cord, plug it into your fridge and keep your fridge running and things like that. But I think that uh, 
But that's like the latest technology is, is a vehicle to everything, putting power into the system, reselling it back to uh, the providers at more than you paid for it. A prime example of that is uh, um, North Boulder Rec Center has a Formata Energy um, a two way uh, level three charger. So they plug their leaf in at night. Uh, when XL need extra power, they just draw it out of the car, mm. and, uh, and the, uh, the rec center has been earning like 300 bucks a month just to be, be plugged into it. So, you know, be for your house as well. Um, that's a whole other side of it, and, and the whole uh, intelligent driving and such is going to be linking all of that. So that, but you even now, I mean, I know what time is the best time to be charging for you, it's after nine o'clock, so yeah. I just set a timer, mm -hmm. plug it in, and let it start charging after nine. I have, I actually have an answer on that. In oh, okay. There is, that. that's already happening. Um, I most recently lived in Vermont, and uh -huh. Green Mountain Power is doing that. They gave me a free EV charger, I have an EV, and I plugged in my EV at six o'clock in the evening, and it wouldn't start charging, and nine o'clock, Click. It turned on and it started charging. But they had, I was enrolled in a program where if there was high demand, they could just turn it off. And it wasn't talking to the car, it was just talking to the charger. Right, right. But um, yeah, that's it, it's happening. And they, yeah, and I got I got a lower rate because of it. Okay. Yeah. So when, when is it happening wrong? <laughs> <laughs> when Mike's done, you went off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got at least Wait, you <laughs> If your charger is Wi Fi connected, couldn't you? Use an app on your phone to set that up anyway. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, a lot of a lot of vehicles or the apps themselves allow you to yeah. do timing and manage charging and scheduling. Especially the scheduled time of use to know exactly when it's going to happen. Right. You choose not to charge just during right. certain hours. Yeah, it's not a real time signal, but it's a step in the it's a big step in the right direction. That I just want to add a little bit to this when thinking about um, EVs and utilities and programs that utilities could offer to the uh, in customer. There's kind of two approaches. There's the active engagement, or there's the passive engagement. The active's really getting down to the charger and you know a utility controlling um, physically when that charger is turning on or maybe the car turning on. Whereas passive would be, let's send a rate signal and allow that customer to make a, a decision. Or let's send them, hey, the wind's blowing or the solar's out. Let's make, you know, let's allow you to make that decision. Um, and you know, engage with us. And so when we think about like the vehicle that starts getting into telematics, um, then yeah, that, that's like the Vermont Green Mountain Power. Um, there's a lot of companies getting into that. So it, it just depends on you know the type of program that you want to enable your customers participate in. Um, and I really think you know if you educate your customers, they'll make the right decisions. You just have to enable that. <laughs> Uh, it, yeah, I wanted to ask about the city in particular getting time of renewables because a lot of what you've been talking about is very much in support of coal and gas burning at night. That's all. That's where the price drops at night and they would like to levelize their loads that the coal plants can burn as uh, economically as possible and last as long as possible. If you put time of renewables, you're going to charge your car uh, during the daytime. It's is the prime time to do that when there's lots of solar. And so you'd encourage employers to have simple level one chargers or maybe level one or level two chargers so their employees can come charge during the daytime when there's plenty of sunshine and right. turn it off at night. Like I, I never charge my car at night. Uh, it, it seems irresponsible to charge your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm saying that, 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 to think about the fact sure. uh, the big power plants like everything to be flat 24 mm -hmm. hours a day and they don't right, like the right. fact that daytimes are high. Renewable energy is like the fact, uh, especially solar, likes the fact that uh, you're using a lot during the daytime hours when the sun is out and you cut your use down to just about zero uh, right. at night. Right. I put my my deep freeze on a timer so it doesn't, it doesn't motor doesn't operate at night. Sure. It comes on during the daytime. Well, I think you're describing kind of uh, the challenge for utilities moving forward. Um, you know, we've made a commitment, Flat River's made a commitment to uh, to decommission Rawhide in 2029, mm -hmm. something like that. So we have to be ready to make that transition, and 
there are all these incremental steps that we need to make along the way and we need our customers to participate to participate with us in ways that enable us to do that and what Zach is saying is you know we have to figure out do you want a choice do you want us just to control the devices in your home do we need to do both and um, you know we're gonna learn a lot about how you all use energy in our community through our AMI but we're also going to have to try some things with rates and with devices and with local solar and batteries and this is new this is new stuff and, and that's a good point and so currently in Longmont the, our, our and, and with Lavery River Power um, and the other cities the generally the, the most um, during the summer for sure most energy is used after 4 or 5 p.m. So 4 or 5 p.m. is when everybody gets home from work and turns on the stove, start cooking, do a lot of stuff. That's when the energy is the most expensive because power, they, they turn on some peaking power plants. They do some things just to hit that, to, to provide that peak. But earlier in the day, you, know, you got a lot of businesses, they're running, they're, they're open and they're doing a lot of, a lot of business. Um, but then after 9 p.m. is when the load starts dropping really low. Um, we don't have, you in Colorado, we gen generally don't have a lot of wind at night um, and you don't have any solar, but, but those, that's when, the, that's when um, the consumers use less, less power. So generally um, the, um, the, the rate goes, is the, the, the um, cost of energy is less um, after say 9 p.m. and all the way until 6 a.m. the next morning. That's when people should be charging their EV and, and, and topping off their, their hot water heaters and doing those kinds of things when energy is, is most available and the cheapest. Well, it, but, yeah. It, it, but it's but the, morally. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, the ethics of it. I think mean, Lyle's point is yeah. if you're a renewable energy kind of guy like Lyle is, <laughs> you realize your carbon footprint. You can charge during the day, right? Yeah. If you, you know that, do it. if you know that during the day there's good sun and good wind, yeah. right? That's right. when renewables are available, and that's when right. the signal should be that now you should charge your EVs and and uh, and heat your water and do those kinds of things when renewables are available. And and, and that that signal from the utility, it, yeah, our, our wind is really good right now, and, and sun is great. Start start using as much energy and. and charge and store energy as much as you can yes. during that time and then you know when when we got to turn on coal-fired power plants or, or gas-fired power plants that's when you would make the decision to not uh, use as much energy uh, use less energy at that time so you have time time of renewables pricing mm -hmm. time of renewables yep. yeah <laughs> but, but we've got to know that I, that's kind of the smart grid part of it we've got to know when wind is energy when when uh, solar is, is a lot of solar on the, on the grid. PRPA does give five minute updates on their other website as to what, what the mix of energy consumption is, or energy generation is. Go ahead. Well, first, I just want to give a shout out to Lyle for that point, um, a point that's never, I've never heard that point made before. So thank you, because it really, um, we really have to think things through. It's not about what works for ONG, it's about what's yeah. going to help our plant. So thank you. And Nigel, I have kind of a strange question. We've had our EV, our bulb since 2017, and several times I I once almost knocked a person off a bike in an alley. I mean, not knocked him off, but scared them because they didn't hear me sneaking up on them. Same with Left Hand Canyon, driving up there, people are riding on their bikes too abreast. They don't know I'm behind them. I don't want to honk. Is there a way to retrofit my car with a, like a yoo-hoo? <laughs> you know, parking lot, same thing, you know, like pedestrians are pushing their grocery cart, they don't know yeah, I'm coming up. It's a good question. I thought that they always had them, but they are only, usually they're only up to a certain speed. So it's only up to, say, uh, 18 miles an hour and then it shuts off. Uh, and then as you slow down and you get to 20 miles an hour, then it comes back on again. So it's not an on, on all of the time thing. A sort of a deer whistle is what you think about. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, but then the other mind. side of that is that everyone said that about EEVs, but if you're driving a Lexus or a, a Toyota or something, most of those cars are pretty silent. The gasoline cars are pretty silent nowadays, so it's difficult to hear them as well. I'm not really sure. I think 
Yeah, there's, yeah, you don't want to hoot, hoot at them because no. you don't want to be freaking them out. They'd be rude. Yeah, no. well, sort of not being rude. It's being polite, but they don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. Craig, go for music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say, I say, I'm coming up behind you. <laughs> On your left. You can put oh, a baseball yeah. card in your spokes or something. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any information on induction ovens? Are there any rebates coming off of that? Or are they... They seem more expensive than other ovens, although I've never really shopped for them. Yeah, we, we are exploring uh, other areas to put our education <coughs> rebates in. At this time, we, we don't. Um, our income qualified program, however, uh, going forward from April 1st, private launch April 1st, we'll be doing uh, ovens and stove tops. Recently, can I just add, a friend of ours just told us that she got a hot plate, an induction hot plate, mm -hmm. and it heats water in like three to Eight seconds is that, so it's you know, if she's not using a stove top, you have to have the right hand. Older County has a lending program, I think you have to go to a building in Boulder to pick it up. But you can, it's like the, you can, it's like checking it out at the library, and it comes with um, pots and pans because you have to have a certain type of cooking equipment to use on induction, but you can check it out for a certain amount of time, try it out in your house, see how you like it. Yeah, it's two weeks. I think it's one of my colleagues that also works on the residential side um, is in charge of that. And you have to pick it up generally at the uh, Boulder County Courthouse, so right downtown. Um, but I think it's a two week lending period, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. We, we do the same thing. We yeah. copy the program. It's really right, actually an awesome idea. Yeah. We just loan people and let people. Yeah, just let them check it out, and a lot of people have questions, okay. and they you know, they don't trust it because they've been cooking with gas for 30 years, and they try it, and they say, wow, this is pretty incredible technology. And so, yeah, we're, we're going to hopefully move that over to the commercial sector, too, um, and, you know, hopefully put some big, uh, you know, convection ovens into, like, big commercial kitchens, but that's maybe, like, a next year kind of thing to the rebates. I, I think you could try it out pretty easily. I mean, Karen's always bragging to me about her little... Yeah. Well, I got what I got. Like, it was like I think it was like forty or sixty bucks okay. on Amazon for a little. little that's stuff. that's one. Yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah, I loved it, it. Wow. and now I have an induction stove. Oh. I wanted to try it before I yeah. switch. That's, yeah. right. that's oh. a great idea. Yeah. Do you want it? <laughs> oh, you can just try it. <laughs> They are more expensive, but the costs are coming down. You said you do them too. You rent them out. Oh, yeah, Boulder. As an observation, just as a completely off, off of what we've just been talking about, but everything we've been talking about tonight, it, every bit of technology that's going on then leads to something else that we then have to fix, you know, or we have to find a, a way around it. And, um, and so every question we ask, ask brings other questions and such. But I have to say that you guys, like long, long, the speed, you know, because he was saying, I, I thought he was going to say 10 years when he said, oh, you know, how long is it going to take to change his meeting schedule well, next year? I, I am blown away by how on it Long One is. With Way more on it than Oh, yeah. <laughs> the speed that you work at, I mean, you know, everything you do, broadband and uh, just everything. It's amazing how I've been in. Colorado for uh, 15 years now, and just to see how you have the city has blossomed. I mean, it's just been marvelous. So I just thought I'd just give you that little sound. <laughs> I just want to say, Nigel, yes. you'd forgot to tell people about the EV shows on Saturday in Lafayette, or you maybe mentioned. Oh, no, I, I, I sort of mentioned it when, <laughs> when the, yes. Cool. That's you driving and talking to you uh, caused me to buy my yeah. Nissan Leaf. And it's been wonderful because I got in the car and got to yeah. feel it. Lovely. So Lovely. it yeah. really works. So go try these cars out. Yeah, there are a lot of events to go to. Or you, you just talk to other people. It is, it's pollinating people. Mm -hmm. it's a, we, we're just, you know, telling you about it. And then it may not work for you, but mm -hmm. it works for other people. And it it's not even the people go, oh, it's the future. It's not, it's actually, it's today. It's yesterday and it's today. Right. If we are finally here. I started in 2009 and it was like pulling teeth to, to talk about it to anyone. Right. Um, but now it's it's just there. And suddenly the it's almost like a sleeping giant. The manufacturer suddenly gone, oh my God. You know, look, looked at Tesla because they hated Tesla because uh, they didn't like him, they didn't like the car, they didn't like, they didn't understand it. Um, and they didn't like his business model. 
you know, that you sort of cut out the dealership. But that's the reality of it. Not every dealership is going to survive this because um, that's what people are doing now. They go online, they do a lot of research, or they talk to other people in a parking lot, and they say, well, what's your car like? You know, or you talk to other people because I talk to you, and then that's how we spread it. And then you go and test drive a couple, go home, order it online like Amazon, mm -hmm. and then it's delivered to your house. There's, you know, people are building these temples to car dealerships, these massive dealerships. It's like you can sell an electric car out of this shed. It's not, it's not the size of the building, it's the quality of the people in that store and the knowledge that they have and that, that, that old mindset of car sales when I just get you into any old car is, is not, not the way anymore. Mm -hmm. we're, we're here to educate the entire society about this transition from eyes to EV and the dealerships are complaining about it and there's, there's plenty of them that do, there's plenty of them that have got it finally. But there's plenty of them that do and it's like they're complaining it's like look we happen to be born at this particular time in time where you happen to own a dealership and it, it falls upon you whether you like it or not to do it and so some are struggling with it but some are really starting to understand how important this is this is car salesman car educator 2.0 <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, imagine you're great. Is there anybody else? Yeah. Let's give everybody a big hand.